Hi, this is Leah Ledgewood. I am giving a lecture today on overcoming insurance obstacles. I'm the former cleft lip palate and craniofacial coordinator in the Department of Dentistry at Boston Children's Hospital. The main goal of my talk is to educate parents on the costs of dental treatment and how to navigate your insurance to try and gain coverage for treatment. If you are following my presentation, you will see on slide two that you will learn about costs associated with dental treatment, what is not covered by insurance, how the cleft law of 2013 works, medical versus dental coverage, how to obtain prior authorizations, understanding your insurance carrier's policy, how to appeal, making sure your claims get paid, uh, the provider role versus parent role in the process, how to advocate, and when to pay for a service versus fight for coverage. On slide three, I will provide you with definitions so that you can understand the insurance lingo. Um, prior authorization or prior auth, the approval of the insurance company, a service or procedure. Um, not all procedures require prior auth. This depends on the code of the procedure and varies by insurance company. Every procedure has a code and some codes are covered and some are not covered. Um, some require a prior authorization in order to be covered. Um, so a prior authorization doesn't necessarily guarantee the payment of a claim. Um, it's just the insurance company's way of saying whether or not something is covered. Um, the next word is claim. Um, the claim is the bill that the hospital or provider's office sends to your insurance company. The date of service is the date on which the procedure occurs, and this is important because all claims, all procedures go by the date of service in which it was performed. Um, the appeal, uh, the appeal is the request for a reconsideration of approval or coverage after the insurance company has denied. This request is basically asking the insurance company to take a closer look at the decision in hopes that it can be approved. In network, the insurance company has a contract with a provider or practice. Reprocess means the request to re-review a claim that has been denied without the claim having to be resubmitted. Um, on slide four, um, I talk about some general um, treatments that are not usually covered by insurance. Um, these are typical treatments that are needed for children with a craniofacial syndrome or cleft palate, and each of these procedures does have a unique code associated with the procedure and a fee associated with that procedure. And again, this just kind of gives you an idea of the general treatment protocol for kids to give you an idea of the out-of-pocket expense overall. The first item on the list is the treatment of cavities. All children can get cavities, but what many parents don't know is that treating cavities on small children often requires a trip to the operating room, which is not usually covered in full by insurance. The average cost out of pocket is about $2,500 and can go up to and even exceed $5,000. The orthodontic records are a series of films and photographs and um, impressions of teeth that the orthodontist needs to do in order to plan a patient's case. Um, these records are necessary in order to have treatment and insurance doesn't usually cover it. Um, the fee can range dramatically um, from about $200 to upwards of $800. Um, interceptive orthodontic treatment is usually an early phase of braces. Comprehensive orthodontic treatment is full braces in an older child. The orthognathic workup is similar to the orthodontic records in that it is a series of diagnostic images and films and studies that the surgeon performs before doing the surgery plan. Again, it's necessary for the procedure, and again, insurances don't usually cover it. 
um, facial implants. Um, you may hear um, your doctor talk about doing some malar implants, which um, is to the cheek, um, and genioplasty, which is to the chin. And usually you don't need both. It's one or the other. Um, and there's a range there, about 3,900 to 4,200 for those. The, um, the dental implants, um, you know, children with cleft palates typically are born with congenitally missing teeth. Um, and um, the implant is the screw part of the tooth, costs about $2,000. The prosthodontic treatment is the crown part of the tooth, the fake tooth part, if you will. Um, and um, that's, again, that's about $3,000 per tooth. So each tooth adds up to quite a bit of money. So depending on what your child's treatment needs are, the costs do vary considerably. On slide five, you'll see the overall cost of treatment. There's a low range, a medium range, and a high range. There's no way to predict um, which range your child will fall into, um, but for financial reasons, it, it's good to just sort of have this in mind and be prepared rather than be surprised. Moving to slide six, you'll see that the most common misconception of parents, um, but my child has a birth defect. I was told that treatment should all be covered under medical. Um, if I had a penny for every t every time a parent said this to me, I'd be I'd be very rich right now. Um, it does seem as though uh, most parents do think that um, because their child has a birth defect, that all treatments will be covered under medical, and um, unfortunately, that's just not the case, especially when it comes to anything to do with the mouth. Um, the coverage depends on the code that's being used and whether that code is something that is a covered benefit under your insurance policy. And that's what determines whether or not it's covered. On slide seven, you'll see that, um, just to go back in history a bit, um, prior to 2013, um, what happened for patients with cleft and craniofacial syndromes? Um, your dental insurance would cover some portion of orthodontic treatment, some portion of um, prosthodontic treatment. Um, it would cover, you know, general dental treatments, cleanings, that sort of thing. Um, all covered, you know, at a percentage based on everyone's plan. Um, you know, would depend. Then on the medical insurance side, in terms of orthodontic treatment, prosthodontic treatment codes are not covered. Um, you might have, um, you know, an orthodontic benefit through dental, but medical insurance would not cover something like that. Um, usually medical insurance companies would have an exclusion in the plan that would specifically say that congenital birth defects are not covered, um, that they may cover things due to an accident or injury, but not for a congenital birth defect. So it's like the opposite of what people think. People think that my child has a birth defect, it should be covered under medical, and in fact, medical believes your child has a birth defect and we're not covering anything. Um, so quite the opposite. Moving to slide eight, um, we see that in 2012, um, a law went into effect. It is called an act relative to the treatment of cleft palate and cleft lip. Um, you can Google, you can put this in a Google search bar and see the full version of the law that was written. Um, but you do see a brief version of it here. Um, basically, cover, coverage shall include benefits for medical, dental, oral, and facial surgery, surgical management and follow-up care by oral and plastic surgeons, orthodontic treatment and management, preventative and restorative dentistry to ensure good health and adequate dental structures, blah, 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 if such services are prescribed by the treating physician and such physician certifies that the services are medically necessary and a consequence of the cleft palate. So you can see that, um, you know, if, if you're not aware of um, the law, um, it was a lot of hard work. A lot of parents advocated strongly um, to help get this law passed. Um, and it went into effect for January 1st, 2013. So when this law went into effect, um, 
most of the parents that knew about the law, um, they had another common misconception, um, which I say on slide nine, that the law was passed and now they think everything's covered. Um, the way that the law was written was a little um, deceptive. Um, it doesn't cover everything in full. Um, it doesn't really translate to the way that things are covered by insurance companies exactly the way it was intended to, and it's unfortunate, um, but it doesn't mean that we can't try to fight to get things to be approved. On slide 10, um, you can see that there are stipulations of the law. Um, these are clearly stated in the um, description of the law. Um, it only covers children under the age of 18. Um, if you are aware, a lot of the um, most expensive parts of the treatment occur when it, the patient is finished growing. Um, so a lot of these kids that get cut off from treatment at age 18, it's just unfortunate because they, they can't receive their treatment until after their age 18. Um, the second stipulation applies to insurance plans. They're state regulated. Um, so that's a little confusing. That was difficult for me to understand and even to explain. But some insurance companies are, um, are state regulated and some are self-insured. Um, a self-insured policy could still be an, a policy that you have through an employer. Um, but a self-insured policy does not apply. So the law does not apply to self-insured policies, only to state-regulated plans. Um, number four, deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance does still apply. So if you have a big deductible, if you have co-payments, if you have co-insurance, that's still under your individual plan, and that would still apply to your child's treatment. Um, referrals and prior authorization prior authorizations do need to be in place, if applicable. Um, and number six, the provider or practice must be in network with the insurance plan. Um, just so you know, this is completely critical to whether or not a insurance company will cover a procedure. Even if the code is covered, if the provider or practice is out of network, the insurance coverage will not apply. Um, and many local dentists and orthodontists do not work with medical insurance. Um, they're dental in nature. They don't have, I mean, medical and medical billing and dental billing are completely opposite. Um, dentist practices don't have billing staff that are equipped to handle these sorts of claims or understand how they even work. Slide 11. If I meet the criteria, does this mean that my insurance will pay the claim? So it seems as though, if we're thinking logically, that if you meet all of the criteria that we just discussed, that your insurance should cover, they should pay for the claim when they get it. However, even if you meet all the criteria, insurance companies will still find reasons to deny. The most common reasons that I saw working at Children's Hospital um, was that the insurance company would state that the procedure was not a covered benefit, that there was no prior off, or that it was the wrong code. Also, um, a lot of patients would not be made aware of the denial by the insurance company until after it was too late to appeal. So that even though if, they, if the insurance company denies for something not being covered benefit, if you appeal it, they will take a closer look and realize it should be covered. But if you're not made aware of the denial until after the period of time has lapsed, then it's too late to do the appeal. So I'd like to discuss each insurance policy that I've dealt with and um, what you know their policy is reflecting the law and my experience with it. Um, on slide 12, you'll see um, the, literally this is a copy and paste from the internet on um, what Blue Cross Blue Shield's policy is on cleft lip and palate treatment. Um, it does say coverage includes the benefits, um, you know, for medical, dental, oral, and facial surgery. Um, and then on slide 13, you'll see the data that I compiled um, from January 2013 to May 2015, 
and you see that roughly about half are covered, half of the claims are getting paid and half of them are being denied. Um, the most common denial reason was not a covered benefit, um, which is ironic since we just saw that uh, medical, dental, oral, and facial surgery was part of the um, policy. So um, here we go to slide 14. Um, we're looking at um, the policy that Tufts has. And this again is this is just what I've taken from the internet. Um, it just says that um, there's no referral necessary, that dental and orthodontic treatment basically are covered. Um, on slide 15, you can see that a good chunk of claims were um, were paid um, and some were denied. Um, some were denied. For, the most common denial reason was either not a covered benefit or no prior authorization was in place when, you know, it clearly states that no prior authorization is actually required. Um, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare um, does also have a policy. Um, it does say here um, in their policy, you can Google it online and see their services that are covered. It does say orthodontic treatment of cleft palate. Um, and it has all sorts of other information here as well. Um, but you can see that um, Harbor Pilgrim has been um, very difficult to work with for the most part. Um, you can see here that um, on slide 17 that about 50% of cases are cut, are paid. Um, a chunk of cases are denied. Um, denial reason for all of them were no authorization. And the pending section are all patients that were pending for years because um, their their claim kept going into this status of pending because there was no prior authorization in place. So if I called if I called Harvard Pilgrim, they would they would tell me that no prior authorization was required. We would submit the claim, and then they would deny it, saying that there was no prior authorization. So we would resubmit it, saying that no prior authorization was actually required. They would look into it, and then um, it would just be in this forever um, pending status. Um, moving on to slide 18, um, we've got a bunch of other health plans that are less common. Um, United Healthcare, Cigna, Aetna, Fallon, Tricare, and Unicare. Um, these are plans that are not typically state regulated. They're self-insured policies. Um, there's no uniform policy on cleft palate coverage. Typically these policies they specifically exclude congenital birth defects. So if you have one of these plans, you need to look at your own policy. Every policy I've seen is different. Um, these plans do require a prior authorization normally, um, and they are notorious for denying claims even when a prior authorization is in place. Um, so just because you have a prior authorization does not mean that your claim's gonna get paid. It still could be your responsibility. Um, these plans, just to keep in mind, are not in network with the Department of Dentistry at Children's. Um, and if an insurance company is not in network, um, you don't have some of the same safety nets as you do if, if an insurance is in network. Um, slide 19 talks a little bit about Mass Health. Um, basically, uh, Mass Health covers, they always cover orthodontic records. They cover one phase of interceptive treatment, a phase of comprehensive treatment. They cover some prosthodontic treatment, but not implants. Um, there's some stipulations, um, but usually kids with a cleft palate diagnosis or a craniofacial diagnosis automatically qualifies. Um, and so some parents will say, well, can my, can my child get coverage under MassHealth? Um, you must meet the income requirement for full coverage. And if you don't meet the requirement, you can qualify but have to pay a premium, which is based on your income. And then you'll have, or you could have MassHealth as secondary that you would pay for out of pocket. And that would pick up whatever the primary insurance doesn't cover. Um, 
slide number 20 talks about the prior authorizations. Um, so if you get a prior authorization from your insurance company and your insurance company denies the claim, um, basically it is your responsibility. Um, insurance companies are actually not required to pay a claim despite having a prior authorization prior auth in place. Um, common reasons for the denial would be that um, they'll say that we build the wrong code. Um, they'll say it's not a covered benefit, even when it is. Um, they'll say that it's the wrong date of service. Um, they'll say lots of different reasons, ev even if they're not actually correct, and they can absolutely get away with not covering the claim. What to do if your insurance company denies the claim? Um, first of all, you need to have a conversation with your insurance company. Um, you want to also have a conversation with the provider's office. Um, you want to reprocess the claim. Um, you want to ask the insurance company to reprocess the claim first. Um, you can also ask the provider's office to have the claim reprocessed on your behalf. You can appeal the claim. Um, appeals can come from the member or the provider, but the time frame is crucial. Um, your insurance policy will dictate the amount of time allowed for an appeal and exactly what needs to be done in order for an appeal to happen. Um, they might need some pa certain paperwork. Um, there's also different levels of appeal. So if something's, uh, if you appeal and it's denied, you can go to level two, you can go to level three, you can go to level four. Um, to learn more about this, you can look online. Um, and I recommend that if you've exhausted all other levels of appeal and you firmly believe that your insurance company under the law should have paid um, for the service, that um, you can contact the Attorney General's office or the Department of Insurance and file, um, you file a complaint. Okay, so number uh, slide number 22 talks about how to make the insurance company pay the claim. Um, the first thing is that you need to advocate. Um, you need to call your insurance company. Um, you need to speak with people at your insurance company and advocate on your child's behalf. Um, you can't expect the provider's office to figure it out. Um, you also um, don't expect that the insurance company will uphold the prior authorization and simply pay the claim. Um, you do need to follow this yourself. Um, you do need to follow the claims until they get paid, and um, you know don't make sh don't wait for the provider's office to call you to tell you. Oh, by the way, your insurance company denied that claim. You're just going to get a bill in the mail, um, and it's going to be very confusing. So. Um, if you can get an advocate at your insurance company, if you can um, speak with a supervisor, have a person, you know, a, an actual person that you can talk to. Um, I find that when parents call and speak with the representative that answers the phone, they always just tell you kind of what you want to hear sometimes. They'll say, oh yeah, that should be covered. And they use the word should because, in fact, it's not covered, um, but should sort of makes it sound like, yeah, that really, geez, damn, that really should be covered without actually putting any responsibility on them. Um, the other thing you want to do, you want to make sure that you follow up. A claim should be paid within three months of the date of service. This is very important. Um, you know, so when your child has the treatment, you want to make sure that that claim is paid within three months. If three months has passed and the claim has not been paid, then there's a problem. So you want to know about it immediately. Um, you want to make, you want to insist, you, if a claim is denied, you want to insist that it be reprocessed as soon as possible. You want to complain. You, you can file a complaint with the Department of Insurance. If your insurance company does not pay for something that they are truly supposed to pay for, then the Department of Insurance should know about it. Um, appeal. Um, you can take your appeal to all three levels of appeal with your insurance company. Um, the thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to refuse to pay your claim. Um, it will still be your responsibility, and your account can still go to a collection agency. So if your insurance company does deny a claim, you are going to need to pay it at your provider's office while you um, go through your appeal. Um, so in conclusion, um, 
we have here on slide 23, we have some do's and don'ts. Um, do advocate to your insurance company. Educate yourself on your insurance policy. Make phone calls. Figure it out. Seek advice from the right people. What you don't want to do is do, a lot of parents spend a lot of time complaining to the provider's office. The provider's office cannot change the mind of your insurance company. We can write letters on your behalf, but complaining to the provider's office doesn't do anything. You need to complain to the insurance company. They're the ones that have the decision to pay or not pay the claim. Um, you don't want to refuse to pay your bills. Um, you know, you can't just say that, oh, well, this should have been covered, um, so I don't actually owe anything. You're still going to get a bill. It's still going to be your responsibility, and your account will still go to collections, and your provider's office won't be able to continue to see your child if their claims are not getting paid. Um, you don't want to delay treatment for your child. I've seen parents where, you know, they delay treatment for their children while they're waiting to find out about their insurance. And then some of the, um, you know, you'll have to ask your doctor, but some of the treatments for children are critical. The, t the time frame is critical. So you don't want to delay treatment for your child if the treatment is critical. And you want to talk to your doctor about that. Um, uh, again, you don't want to expect the provider's office to do the legwork for you. You you very well might have to do some of the legwork yourself. Um, don't argue with the administrative staff at the provider's office. I've had so many conversations with, with parents. They're upset because their claims aren't getting paid. It is not the fault of the administrative staff at the provider's office. It is the insurance company. Um, if the claims aren't getting paid, it's because of the insurance company, and they will try to make it look like it's because it's the fault of the provider's office. They'll say, oh, they billed under the wrong code, or they had the wrong this or the wrong that, and, you know, most of the time that's not the case. Um, let's see. So ortho claims from June 2015 to July 2016 is my last slide, and that was the last bit of um, uh data that I collected while I was at Children's and as you can see with most of the insurance companies we're seeing more green than red. Um, I did figure out some ways um, to get some claims to pass. Um, insurance companies were just sort of more aware of the situation and passing claims more easily. Um, so I do feel sort of optimistic that as time goes on um, that insurance companies will um, you know, be more apt to honor um, the cleft law of 2013. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, if your child has a craniofacial syndrome that is not a cleft palate, um, your child does not qualify under that cleft law. And um, it's going to be, you know, a matter of fighting with your insurance company, getting the... Um, provider's office to write letters on your behalf and, you know, just trying to advocate with your insurance company um, to pay claims for you. Um, if you need help or assistance, um, you can um, rely on the help from the foundation. Um, they can put you in touch with some um, materials that might be helpful. Um, you can also rely on the help of the, um, the coordinators at Children's. Um, they are very helpful. And um, I, wish you, I wish everyone that hears this lecture the best of luck with their children. And if there's any way that I can help, please contact you know, the foundation and you can ask to leave a message for me. Again, this is Leah Ledgewood, I'm the former coordinator of the cleft lip, palate, and craniofacial program in the Department of Dentistry at Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you.